Hi, everybody, and welcome to this lesson on the basics of EC2 infrastructure. So in this lesson, we're going to take a look at, uh, you know, some of the basics of EC2s, what they are, how they operate, how the infrastructure is, and so on. So an EC2, or an Elastic Cloud Compute, provides basic scalability computing capacity in AWS. So in other words, they are basically virtual machines or virtual servers that are offered by AWS. They're referred to as Elastic Cloud Compute, hence the name EC2. Now, EC2s provide a host of features. They are very powerful. They're very robust. Um, again, first and foremost, they're virtual computing environments or instances. So, uh, in other words, virtual machines. Uh, you know, there's lots of different things we can do with EC2 instances. We can configure them in a number of ways, which we'll take a look at throughout the rest of this course. So the first and basic concept of EC2 infrastructure is something called Amazon Machine Images or AMIs. Now, AMIs are basically a template that contains a software configuration. So for example, an OS uh, and a number of applications. So for an AMI, uh, you basically launch an instance or launch a EC2, which is a copy of a Amazon Machine Image running a virtual server in the cloud. So you can have or you can launch multiple instances or of an AMI, uh, for example, like the image that you guys see on the screen now. So your instances keep running until you stop them or terminate them or you know they fail um, for one reason or another. And if, for example, they fail or you stop and you can launch a brand new one from a new AMI. So AMIs are essentially just machine images that are hosted on AWS, which we can through which we can launch our EC2 instances. Now you can have pre-configured AMIs or you can have customized AMIs. And we'll take a look at AMIs also in a little bit, in a lot more detail a little bit later on in the course. Now an instance is basically a virtual server in the cloud. Uh, its configuration at launch, again, is a copy of an AMI. Now you can launch different types of instances from a single ANI. Uh, an instance type essentially determines the hardware of the computer that you're trying to launch. And there are a number of instance types that we can launch in terms of the hardware config. Another concept uh, of the basic infrastructure when you're launching EC2 instances are availability zones and regions. Now, EC2s are hosted in multiple locations worldwide. Now, these locations basically are composed of regions and availability zones. And if you're not familiar with uh, a region and availability zone, a region is basically a geographic area. And within a region, you have ab availability zones or essentially data centers. And each region has at least a minimum of two availability zones or physical data centers for high availability and redundancy. And AWS you know, operates very robust and state-of-the-art data centers uh, with you know, some of the latest hardware and software that's out there today. Now, each region is completely independent. Each availability zone is isolated, but availability zones in a region are connected through low latency links, as you guys see in the diagram. Now, ECT resources are either global or tied to a region or tied to an availability zone. Now, when you view the resources in your AWS environment, you'll only see the resources that are tied to the region that you specify. Now, that's because regions, like I mentioned previously, are isolated from each other. And when you launch an instance, you must select an AMI that's in the same region. Now, if an AMI is in another region, you can copy the AMI to the region that you're using. So those are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind with the regions and availability zones. With Availability zones. When you're launching a EC2 instance, first and foremost, you're selecting a region. Now, with availability zones, you can also select which AZ you want to launch your, your EC2 instance into. Now, if you distribute your instances across multiple availability zones and let's say one fails, you can design your application so that an instance in another availability zone can handle the request, hence the redundancy and the high availability. There are also a host of other things that we can do with availability zones, such as you know using elastic IP addresses to mask the failure so the users or the application does not know that a host computer has failed and so on. Now, an availability zone is usually represented by a region code followed by an identifier, like the example you guys see, us-east-1a. 
Now, to ensure that resources are distributed across availability zones for region, AWS independently maps availability zones to the names for each AWS account. So, for example, for US East 1A, you might not be in the same location as US East 1A for another AWS account. And you can pick and choose which region you want to operate in or you want to launch your EC2 instance into along with availability zone. Now, when you're launching EC2 instances, you can either let AWS select a default availability zone or you can select your own customized one. It's always recommended to let uh, AWS choose the availability zone within the region just because they pick the one that will be the most efficient for your organization. Uh, you know, based on what kind of load they have in each availability zone, because that information obviously is not available to us. So that's why it's recommended you let them choose which availability zone the EC2 instance should be launched into. But you do have the option to select which availability zone. Now, obviously, launching an instance requires storage, right? So when you launch an instance, the root device volume basically contains the image or AMI that you use to boot the instance. Now, all AMIs are basically backed by what's called an EC2 instance store, which means that the root device for an instance launched from an AMI is an instance store volume created from a template which is usually stored on Amazon S3. Now, uh, recently, uh, not so recently, maybe about a year to a couple years ago, AWS introduced EBS, which is Elastic Block Storage. So that means so now what basically happens is the root device for an instance launched for an AMI is usually backed by an EBS volume or an EBS snapshot. Now you do have an option to choose between AMIs that are backed by instance stores and AMIs that are backed by EBS volumes. Uh, and we'll take a look at what the difference is between instance stores and EBS volumes in the storage section. But um, you do have an option to pick which one you want to choose, but it's recommended that you use EBS just because it's uh, a lot more robust than an instance store in terms of its operability. Now, for instances that, are, that use instance stores for the root device, automatically have one or more instance volumes available with one volume which is going to serve as a root device volume. Now, when you launch an instance, the image that's used to uh, boot the device or boot the instance is copied to the root volume. Any data on the instance store volume persists as long as the instance is running, but the data is deleted when the instance is terminated. So keep that in mind. That's why it's recommended to use EBS because with EBS, the data is not deleted when the instance is stopped or terminated. But with the instance store, the data is basically deleted if the instance is terminated or if the instance fails. So if you have mission critical data uh, hosted on the instance and you're using an instance store backed uh, storage volume, and for some reason, if you accidentally terminate it or even if, uh, for example, the hardware fails, all of your data is going to be lost. Now, EBS, on the other hand, if you use uh, for the EBS as a root device, EBS snapshot referenced by the AMIs are used, and you can optionally use other EBS volumes uh, depending on, again, the instance types. Now, for EBS-backed instances, they can be stopped and later restarted without affecting the data that's stored in the attached volumes. And there are various instance and volume-related tasks you can do with EBS-backed instances. So, for example, you can modify the properties of an instance, change its size, update the kernel. You can attach your root volume to a different running instance for debugging, debugging or any other purpose. So, th that's why it's recommended to use EBS-backed uh, uh, EC2 instances is because they are a lot more robust uh, and the configurabil configurability uh, is considerably more uh, for EBS-backed EC2 instances. Now here you guys see the basic process that or, uh, that an EC2 instance takes, for example, when a volume is created. So when you create a volume, uh, it goes into the pending state, and from the pending, it can go either to the available, or if you're creating it, it's going to go to the available state. After it's available, you can attach the volume to your EC2 instance. Now these are for, again, this process law is for EBS-backed volumes. Now, multiple things we can do. Once it's in the available stage, we can delete the volume. If, it, if you delete the volume, it goes back in the pending state, and from the pending, it goes into the deleted state. You can optionally attach a volume, or you can detach a volume. So let's say that I've attached a volume to an EC2 instance, but I've just uh, 
started up a new EC2 instance, I can detach a volume and attach it to a new EC2 instance. So again, like I said, the process flow for EBS volumes is considerably more robust than it is for instance store volumes. Now here's a quick comparison in terms of if you are using a Windows server as compared to if you're using a EC2 uh, Windows instance. This gives you a good chart in terms of what the differences are uh, for your traditional on-prem hardware as compared to using virtualized hardware, which is provided by AWS. Now, if you're using an on-prem physical server, again, your resources and capacity are physically limited to the capacity of the server, whereas for EC2 instances, they're scalable. So let's say that you launched initially an instance, uh, you know, that might have, uh, you know, eight gigs of memory. If you are in a physical environment, if you have it on-prem, upgrading that is a considerably uh, long task. Whereas for an EC2 instance, with a couple of clicks of a button, you can essentially upgrade the hardware of your server in an instance. So it's that's the main benefit provided by migrating to the cloud or by EC2 instances is the scalability. And obviously, you're only paying for the infrastructure that you're using. So as soon as you terminate the instance, you stop, you know, your charges are stopped. You stop paying for it. Uh, whereas, obviously, if you bought a server, you have it until, uh, you know, it, the end of life or you get rid of it or you resell it and so on. So it's a good chart to help you differentiate the, between uh, a traditional Windows PC, Windows server that's sitting on your premises as compared to using a EC2 instance, which is on the cloud. Here's also a comparison of the boot process of uh, if you have a on-prem server as compared to an EC2 instance. So on the top left-hand side, you guys see, you know, a traditional process of booting up a server. It's in the off mode. Uh, you power it on, it goes into cold booting and then in the running state. And then there, you know, you have a soft reboot, you have a hibernate, or you have a sleeping mode. So that's the essential process that a server follows uh, in terms of the different power states. Now compare that with the power states of an EC2 instance. Again, everything, these are, th this process is specifically for EBS backed instances. So when you're launching uh, from an AMI or from an image, you know, it goes from the pending to the running. Running, you can reboot, you can shut down, you can terminate. That's specific to the actual server. Now, the best part about EC2 instances and especially EBS-backed instances is that, is that the hard drive essentially stays separate from the physical server. So you can take the hard drive, detach it, and attach it to another physical instance. So let's say that you, know, you launched an AMI on a Windows server. Uh, you notice that your application you know, is using more resources than you had initially uh, thought, you know, let's say that you thought it would only use 8 gigs of memory, but it requires 16 or 32. What you can do is detach the volume that has the application, launch a new instance with 32 gigs of RAM or with 64 gigs of RAM and attach that volume back into that instance. And hence, you've essentially upgraded your hardware uh, without affecting your application, your configuration, your software. Now, doing that on a on-prem server, again, it's uh, it would be probably a few days task in terms of taking it offline, uh, adding the physical memory, booting it up, configuring it and so on. Whereas for AWS or EC2 instances, uh, essentially in a couple of minutes, you can upgrade your hardware without having any adverse effects on the users or on the application. So this is the basic infrastructure or basic setup of EC2 instances. And essentially a lot of people uh, get confused when they hear the name EC2 or Elastic Cloud Compute. Uh, but in, in layman's terms, essentially, they are virtual servers or virtual instances which are provided by AWS. Very robust, very scalable, very configurable, as we will see when we go throughout this course.